we're on we're recording right now so we might as well just go on to well uh, all right <laughs> okay so when you first got to Syracuse in uh, 1949 yeah, 1949 and there was nobody else doing uh, the black rhythm and blues sound no, that you no. were uh, you were into at the time um, who did you play with around here first that uh, uh, first of all I went and sat in with the local uh, so-called jazz musicians of the time and uh, just you know just learning my my craft and getting established here so I didn't do any rhythm blues with them so they liked what I was doing as far as playing and singing I sang a few standards you know so the uh, my uncle <clears throat> owned Sorrento's and so he wanted to put music in so he says look get get some uh, musicians together and start playing here. So I got Sam Barone, Elmer Antonello on drums, Sam Barone on bass, and Mike Peluso on uh, piano. And we went into uh, Sorrento's. That was our first gig with a small group. Mm -hmm. And I was doing, by that time, Night Train came out. Okay? So we were doing Night Train, we were doing the blues, I was singing Good Rockin' Tonight because those songs came out in 46 and 47. Right. And I learned Fanny Brown, which became my song. Right. I mean, that, that, was, that was my signature song up here because they never heard of Winoni Harris and they never heard of uh, Roy Brown, right. which were the originators. So we started creating a following at Sorrento's. And that started, that's what started the, the blues movement in Syracuse. What did you call that particular band? Jimmy Cavallo time? Quartet. Okay. Then <clears throat> we branched out. We played a few places out of town. We played uh, right here at Fulton. We played the hotel. We went to uh, Utica quite a bit. Then we wound up at Sylvan Beach to Castro's. Uh, that was 19, early 1950. And we were packing that joint. We, we were getting like 1,000, 1,200 people every Sunday afternoon. Wow. Yeah, and it was big, big place. They liked the jitterbug, they liked the dance, and I was doing all that house rock and stuff, you know. And I wasn't even the house rockers yet. And we were, we were just honking and stomping. Guys would come, musicians from Utica would come and sit in with me. Uh, Vic Kirch from um, Frankfurt came up with his tenor. And um, I had another, then I added another tenor man, Diz Lee, who was a great player. He was my piano player in, in the Carolinas. But he wanted to get up front with me. He wanted to be a saxophone player. So he learned tenor. That's how we got that two tenor sound going, which I became famous for with the uh, house rockers. So I did that for three years, Sylvan Beach. Guy paid off his whole, his whole mortgage with, with the business that we did. That was from, say... 1949 to 53. Okay. When, tell us about your first uh, uh, recording session, how that came about. <clears throat> that was in... Um, Auburn. The guy had a single reel-to-reel -reel Ampex. He wanted to put out, a, and 45s were coming in now, okay? And he wanted to put out a, a, a record on me. So we recorded um, Leave Mary Women Alone, Rock the Joint. Uh, I didn't record Fanny Brown that session. Uh, we did two others. Ha Ha Blue, something else. Anyway, that was my first recordings outside of lugging a big heavy web core in to record ourselves, you know. Right. But uh, then he released it on BSD label. That was that was my first. That was and that was just like a, a local release? Local, yeah. It didn't do anything um, nationally. Right. But these records finally found their way into the mainstream of uh, nostalgia, rhythm, and blues. You know, they wound up in England and uh, Russia. Uh, in a lot of places, all of a sudden, these records are showing up, and uh, I got two albums home of all the work I did with Coral, which I never recorded. They were all 45s. They were bootleg, okay? And that comes later, that, that section. But th that's my early stuff. Recording, after I became the House Rockers, we did some recording in uh, Baltimore, Sunnyside label. Uh, we, did a, we did a label with Dandy Dan Leonard. Uh, Darcy, he called it. That's where you got your Fanny Brown Holly Gully, which we, we reworked. Yeah. And the other side, it was early in the morning. Okay, that was 63. But between 
BSD in 53 and 63, a whole lot of things happened, okay? Tell us about that. How did your uh, connection, well, actually, when did uh, the House Rockers name come about? That's when it happened. I left, I, I got a guy out of Schenectady, he wanted to be a man, uh, a booking, he's a booking agent, but he wanted to be a manager. But the only thing, the problem he had is he didn't have any money to back up being a manager. When you got a manager, they got to have some money to pay this guy, to pay that guy. Look, put him in the paper, I uh, want him in the magazine, uh, I want you to play this record. And that's, that's the early phases of payola, early, okay? 100 bucks here, 50 bucks there. And his name's on there, Fred Gray. So, but he uh, arranged, <clears throat> I told him I wanted to go on the road. So we went out with the quartet. And that was the first, that was Jimmy Cavallo Quartet. It was not the House Rockers yet. And we went out in 54 with that. And who did I have? I had Pete Bataro, who was playing with Stan now. Um, I had um, Paul Masinga, who's living in Florida, bass player. And um, who did I have on piano? Oh, I had uh, Paul Canino on piano. He was a piano player out of Rome. He used to come up and sit in with me at the, the Castro's. So I said, look, I want to put this band together go on the road. So we first went to Rochester, okay? Now we got this honking, stomping, night train, and blah, blah, blah. By that time, uh, uh, we went to Rochester. They had nothing but jazz. This, this was a, strictly a jazz town. Eastman School of Music and all that. Young Mangiones were growing up. Uh, Joe Romano, one of the super players. I will come in with my house rocking, and still Jimmy Cavallo Quartet. We went in for two weeks, this club in uh, Rochester, and we stayed 13 weeks. <laughs> By the time the word got out, they were all lined up waiting to get in, okay? I was standing on bars, I was standing on chairs, I was playing on my back, you know, all that, all the stuff that went with that time period. We went into Canada, did Toronto, we did um, um, Hamilton, Toronto, London, went all the way up as far as... Um, Montreal, Rouen, Quebec, so we were making kind of a, a splash. Then we came back and we went to Detroit. Now this is where the House Rockers were born. I had a little beef with the bass player in Detroit. He was, he was getting, he wanted to be a, a star. He wanted to be up front, do his thing. And, um, which I didn't mind, you know, I, I, I feature anybody anytime as long as they got talent, you know. I did that with Stanley. I always called the guys down. But this guy went upstage, and so we got into it. And uh, consequently, I just fired the whole trio. They came back here, called the agent. He says, "I got. Don't worry." He says, uh, "We got it covered." I said, "Well, we're going to Schenectady next. We'll be at the Rock Mar. I have no band, and we're booked." He says, "You'll have a band by the time you get there." I says, "Okay." He calls Niagara Falls. There's an active band working. Joe Murillo. Tony Morello, and they're all there. That's that's the house rocker right there. Joe Morello, Tony Morello, Chuck Delora, and me, and we got the piano player out of Canada because I was up in Canada. I gave him a call. So the piano player, we we I took over that whole band that was already active, and Joe was playing. He's talking about well, I was the first white guy. Well, Joe was like. Two steps behind me with that. Was uh, he aware of you? I mean, did he? he uh, yeah, he knew. I, he, he knew that I was making a splash. That's why he didn't mind coming to Schenectady and letting me take over the and, band. And was he doing the same type of material or, or same type of sound? Exactly, exactly. In fact, uh, you go play the rock, rock, rock. You, you'll hear Joe playing the solos. Hmm. Uh, you'll hear him and I on foot stomping. And he was in his, pretty much the same bag, but he didn't have the singing talent and the front man talent that I had. He, he sang a couple of blues tunes and then he blew his horn. But I had a little more going for me. And he knew that we were on a rise. We were rolling toward a little bigger situation. And the only thing that stopped me from being a, a super duper big star was the hit record. I didn't get the hit record. Every time I put out a record, Fats Domino, I found my thrill. Put out another record, a little Richard, bong, bong, dong, 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 dong. so you know, and I was fighting all that, and then they get take a guy like Pat Boone, try to make him a rocker, which was that was sacrilegious. Okay, <laughs> he, he he automatically ruined the careers of Fats Domino and Little Richard in one stroke. 
so anyway, we were we we're going good. Uh, we finally went to New York with the and we became the House Rockers. We had our pictures taken at Kriegsman, and they set us up uh, a recording audition. And uh, we were in New York, and we went we went to Nola Studios in New York. I don't know if you know you're familiar with Nola. Well, Nola is the most famous studio since the Brill Building down there. The Brill Building, of course, took over all the rock and roll um, um, Sorry. music, yep. publishing yep. and all that. <clears throat> but uh, NOLA had all these rehearsal studios and halls, and everybody would go there to make their acetate dubs. There was no tapes in those days. It was just all, yep. you know. And uh, so, God, there must have been 15, 20 groups there. And all the representatives of the record company, well, I wanted to go with Atlantic or Atco because I knew that was the strong rhythm and blues label. And I would have, would have been the first white rhythm band in that, in that stable. But there was a guy called Jack Hook who was listening as well. So we did Fanny Brown. Boom, 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 boom. Um, that that type of that that version, and uh, he went to the my manager who was setting this thing up, and he says uh, he says uh, anybody signed that group yet? And he says no. He says we're we're waiting to see you know what we're going to get out of this. He says well I he says I am hooked up with Alan Free. That's all he had to say. Alan at, in nineteen fifty four was the biggest thing in New York. I mean he was. He was doing all the records. He coined the phrase rock and roll. He took rhythm and blues albums and started calling it rock and roll because in every rhythm and blues song, you'll hear, we're going to rock, we're going to rock and roll tonight. So that's where he got the idea. And he says, I want, I want Alan to hear you. He says, Alan is uh, hooked up with Decca, who had the, uh, the, the young label was Coral. Alan had a piece of all these groups that he put on those labels. So I said, all right. You know, he comes in and he says, what do you think about Carl? I said, well, Carl's a good label. You know, Decca, they were trying to break into R&B, but R&B, Atlantic had a lock on it. Okay, that was way before, uh, what's that, uh, Motown, way before that. <clears throat> and uh, this is funny. We didn't even put our horns in the cases. We, we just we grabbed everything and uh, we're going out through New York. We got in a cab. I went down to the radio station, WINS, where Alan was doing his afternoon rock and roll show. And we walked in, and we're in the studio now, and he's playing, all right now, and here we got one by the moon glows, blah, 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 blah. And uh, all right, you guys out there, here's the da, da, da. And then he go, and then he turned it off, and he said, okay, let me hear the band. And, Boom, 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 boom. Everybody here seeing this fan, and we're knocking our brains out, man, because we're all young, you know. And uh, we got about a, a chorus and a half to the song. He went, and that was the moon glows, blah 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 blah. Now we're going to put on. Uh, you should know this one, all you cats out there. Uh, here's a Fats Domino and uh, blah, blah 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 blah. I'm in love again or something, right? And they turned out and he said, okay. And wherever we stopped playing, we picked it up. Da 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 da. da, da, da. <laughs> so and it was it was a gas. Um, so after we got through, he called right there from the booth in between. He called Decca. He said, I'm sending a group over. He said, I want you to sign them and set up some recording sessions for them. Okay, so that was good. And then we did the choral records. And that was with the band that you went down New York with, the, the House Rockers. Rockers. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we did the choral records. Did they uh, supplement that with any uh, other outside musicians, or was that Yeah, uh, I, had, um, I had a couple of studio cats there. Al Kyola on, on guitar, guitar was on a couple of sides. And another super duper was George Barnes, who oh, was yeah. also wow. a great... Studio guitar player. Absolutely. So they added that to my mix because I didn't have guitar. I had piano, and, and then we had uh, three guys singing. They were doing a dua, dua, you know that stuff. So they they supplemented a little. And but from that, uh, a lot of things happened. The only thing that did not happen, okay. And at the time, I was a little disturbed about it because I'm trying to be I'm trying to become a big rock star, you know. And nothing, I'm getting work. I never starved. 
But the only thing that did not happen is the hit record, okay? Uh, the payola thing back then was um, was nothing compared to what it is today. You pay a disc jockey a hundred bucks, he play a song all day, because it's brainwash, you know. But you had to pay a hundred to one in Buffalo, one in Baltimore, one in Los Angeles, one in, you know, all these, they're called breaking areas, these were to break the records. So, and we were only making twelve fifty a week for the group, you know, so how can we put out a hundred, six, seven hundred dollars a week for this? So, but the good things that came from it, uh, Alan put me in a movie, Rock, mm -hmm. Rock, Rock. Uh, I was supposed to be the Bill Haley game so much money, so Alan says, to hell with Bill, let's use Jimmy and the House Rockers. So, so we got the movie. From the movie, we got the Apollo. I got a, I had a 14 day, 10, 14 day run at the Apollo, and we were the first white rock and roll band to play the Apollo, okay? Buddy Holly came after me, and before me, back in the old days, you had like um, the white groups that played the Apollo were like Charlie Barnett, the big man, and uh, Louis Prima had a big band back then, 15 pieces. Now, I know they played the Apollo. So we're not the first white musicians, but we were the first white rock and roll group. And um, I met Ray Charles there, week before I was supposed to play there. He was just finishing out. Uh, and from that, we played uh, in New York City. We were teamed up with Smokey Robinson. Della Reese was the headliner before she became a television star. And Smokey, me. Then we then we teamed with Laverne Baker. And were, were these uh, Alan Freed shows that you're talking about, uh, or? Well, no. A lot of them were, were through my agency. The, the um, my manager or so so called manager signed me with the uh, Gale Agency. All right, this was a big agency in New York. It was Tim and Mo Gale. Now they handled a lot of the mainstream performers like Don Cornell, Teresa Brewer. And they wanted to dabble in all deck rock artists. and roll. Yeah, all deck, deck, all deck artists, and coral yeah. artists, sure. And uh, so we hooked up with Gail, and they got all these things for me. They got uh, the Apollo. They got, um, um, we did a lot of, uh, they put me on a black circuit. I, I did uh, shows at black beaches, uh, Sparrows Beach, Maryland. It was strictly a black beach. I did a show with Buddy Johnson Big Band with the, uh, um, Prysock, uh, Arthur Prysock vocalist, uh, and the, I had the Turbans, the Cadillacs, um, the Cleft Tones. We were, I worked with all these guys doing this black circuit because we sounded so black, you know. So then they put me in Pittsburgh in an all black club. Then came Wildwood. Wildwood, uh, 1956 and 57. And I worked with the Trineers, and uh, they came running out. They didn't, they couldn't believe what they were hearing. By that time, we were into a lot of Ray Charles, Hallelujah, I Love Her So, I Got a Woman, uh, a lot of fats. Uh, I went to that because I, I, I got tired of waiting for my own hit record, you know, so I said, I got to keep going. So I, I just fine-tuned my home, my performing skills, and I just kept playing the clubs, doing my thing. Uh, just using other people's uh, records, you know, what can I do? I wasn't a songwriter. So uh, Wildwood, the second year I worked with Bobby Darren, got to know Bobby very well. Um, I ran the whole thing right through 1959. We did Summer's Point. Uh, we went to Vegas twice, uh, the House Rockers. Uh, then uh, we came into, uh, came back and I disbanded and came back to Syracuse in the 60s. So 60, 61, and 2, I wound up at Three Rivers Inn, being house MC, working the lounge. And I took that group out. So that group from, uh, I took that group to um, Atlantic City, did the 500 Club. Uh, an agent came in, put me in Tokyo. We flew all the way over to Tokyo. We did Tokyo, Okinawa, um, all the Army and Navy bases, and we had a, like a 13-week run over there. So that was the strength. That was the the meat of my career at that point. And I learned a lot at Three Rivers during those early 60s because I worked with Nat King Cole. I worked with Bobby Darren came in. He became a big uh, 
went from rock and roll to big band and Sammy Davis type of stuff. Worked with Sammy twice, Nat Cole once, uh, Frankie Avalon wanted to do the adult thing, so he he tried to get rid of the D.D. Dinas and try to do an adult act. I worked with Frankie, I worked with um, uh, Rosemary Clooney, um, Nat, Nat was the, that was, that was my crowning. I, I loved working with Nat Cole. Uh, then uh, Sa then uh, Sammy backed, he was going to help me, but uh, I don't know what happened there, but uh, he backed Gregory Hines. Uh, Gregory Hines came into Three Rivers with a group called Hines, Hines, and Dad. It was him and Maurice, his father, was either the drummer or something, so it was like a high energy, uh, like Sammy when he first went out with the Madison Trio. So he, he backed uh, Gregory and them. Uh, but then after that, uh, after the Three Rivers, I went back on the road, and I went to Tokyo and all that. That came in 64, 65. After the 500 Club, Skinny D'Amato sent me to the Fountain Blue in Miami. I did uh, two weeks there. I was supposed to meet Frank Sinatra, but he got sick. And I had to leave that gig and go over to the Bahamas. And then Frank felt better. And I missed, I missed that meeting. That whole meeting set up and we're going to have a drink and all that. After that, uh, I settled in Florida in 68. And I just started concentrating on working there and coming up here every year. I've been coming back to Syracuse once a year for the past 20 years at least. And that's when I hooked up with the... Uh, oh, I had the little section there with uh, Chuck, Tony, and John Latosha. I, mm -hmm. had, uh, I had those guys with me for about seven years. When That was during that 60s, early 60s period. Right. Uh, I, I organized that band at the Parquet on the north side, and uh, that became the Jimmy Cavallo sound here in Syracuse because those three guys played like a glove. It was They were just rhythm conscious, you know. And I broke them in to get in the pocket and groove. So they knew all the Ray Charles things, they knew all the fats, they knew uh, Brother Jack McDuff, we did a lot of that uh, B3 organ stuff. That was a period between 60 and 64. And that's it, here I am. And then I hooked up with Stan Kalala. <laughs> what else you want to know? What was the last recording that you did? The last um, that was out there? Yeah, before all this compact disc stuff. Um, I think the one in Baltimore, Sunnyside Label, was the last thing I did. In what year? Um, that had to be... Uh, it was before 61, because in 61... Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Well, you, you did some last one stuff. I did in 63 with Dandy Dan. So that would have been the... That uh, was the last one. That was a, a, a Fanny Brown, Holly Gully. Mm -hmm. We decided to do Fanny Brown, but at that time, the Holly Gully was a very popular dance, and it had that... And you know, and so, well, let's turn it into a Holly Gully, but we've done everything with it you can think of. And to this day, that's my signature song. They think that the, I did that originally. And uh, so that probably was the last one until I did that thing with uh, Stan. The last thing I did was last year with Stan. That was that was my first CD, actually. And I did a little thing with your brother here. I think what we did here today is an optimistic endeavor. I'm hoping it works out, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's the way I feel about CDs, but I don't mind having them, man. I, I, I'll make as many as you want to make. If somebody says you want to do a jazz CD, I'm good. Give me the jazz players and I'll do that. Uh, I just enjoy the music. I enjoy playing. I enjoy the effort. If nothing comes of this, I had a good time. I won't I won't be down in the mouth about it. If something does come to it, I'll be ecstatic at my mm -hmm. age. Well, you're retired, but you're willing to... I'm not retired musically, and I'm not retired uh, um, with my energy and my uh, my positive feeling. I have that um, enthusiasm, and I have that positive uh, feeling. Uh, even you, you saw it here when we did the recordings. I, I didn't do this, did I? No. I didn't complain about doing take after take. I just, I'm into what I do. I enjoy what I do. Period. It's, it's very apparent. I'm, I, I was uh, very fortunate to get the talent that I got. I'm also fortunate that I'm one of the front runners. You know, I'm one of the innovators. People say, Jimmy Cavallo, you got his records? You know, that kind of stuff. Guy come from Russia come over, came to the club in Florida, says, uh, 
Where's Jimmy Cavallo? I gotta meet this Jimmy Cavallo. He's a Russian, right? So I go up and I met him, Igor, Ivan, some who the hell knows. <laughs> he says, Vah, Jimmy Cavallo. I can't believe I'm looking at Jimmy Cavallo. He's going like that. He says, I'm guitar player. He says, behind Iron Curtain, long time ago, we smuggled your records in with Bill Haley, Jimmy Cavallo and the House Rockers, the Fats Domino, and I learned how to play. He says, I had to meet you. I give him pictures, tapes. He says, oh boy, when I go back, he says, they're going to love this. Same thing happened in London. So if you've got a connection for London, group came over from there, Ray Gelato, good group, nice guy. Louis Prima Cologne, okay, that's all he plays. Sings like him, plays like him. He says, I learned to play saxophone listening to Foot Stomping, your record. I had no idea that those records were in London and Russia and places like that. It just floored me, you know. Are you the first white rock and roller? I think I am. Yeah, did you use uh, I memory? think I am. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's documented. Uh, not first rock and roll, white rock and roller. I'm the first white rhythm and blueser. There's a difference. Because mm -hmm. when it was changed to rock and roll, there was a lot of white groups out there. All doing what I did that I started to do back in the 40s. Before this music ever, 46, 47, 48, before it even became rock and roll, it was rhythm and blues. Then I think I was the first white Rhythm and had the first white rhythm and blues band. That I, that I think so. How do you want to be remembered in the history books when it's all? Uh, I want to be remembered that no matter that I didn't become in in a big pond, a big star. I was a little, I was a big big star in a small pond of groups. But uh, whatever I did, um, I always performed like a big star, and I always made people happy. What I did put smiles on people's faces. And when they're smiling and giving me standing ovations, uh, and I'm happy doing what I'm doing, and I see that, it's a gratification. That's, that's what I'm remembering for. Jimmy was a great performer and made a lot of people happy. I think that's about it for me. You got some okay. couple other things? Or? Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Let these guys play that run, okay?